There we go. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining me, Justin. This is really so cool. Glad to be here. Um, yeah. I followed you for a long time. I forgot even what. This is how crazy it is and how impactful your podcast was that I listened to because I forgot the name of the podcast, the host. I, don't, I, I even went back and tried to search for it. I don't know. I just remember you talking about the mental performance side of not just sports but life in general. And I was like amazed. It started me going down a rabbit hole of all sorts of things. So I've been following you since I oh – man, it's been like a year or two, two years, three years since I heard wow. it. And so uh, – it was just funny going through that and going, where did I hear him? Like, I know I've, I know I heard him on some podcast. I thought it was this one, but I don't know. So that's how impactful your, your thing was. So I really appreciate it. You're on the show. Wow. Thanks for having me. Honored to, honored to be on the show. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, I, I'm going through like your Instagram and the Twitter feed and everything. You posted this one thing about the negative, um, I forgot exactly how it was worded, but about how negative energy is like super contagious. Yeah. And it, it, I've, I've thought this for a while. Why is, and, and with, especially with the media cycle nowadays and what they're posting on, like what, what people are attracted to is that negative, like that negative outlook on life versus the good, which there's so much good, but if you report the good, it doesn't get any traction. And I've wondered if you have any thoughts or opinions or anything on how that, why people are attracted to the negative side so much more. Yeah, I think one of the ways my thoughts, one way that could be, that, that it could be, I think there's a, you ask 10 different people, you might get 10 different answers. But I think one thing we do know that research shows us is that we have a negativity bias. So just as human beings, we are wired to, to view things in a negative light a lot more easily. And the reason for that is not because we're negative creatures. It's because our bodies, we desire homeostasis. We, de we desire to be comfortable. We don't want pain. And so a lot of times where our brain, if you see a workout in CrossFit, you're like, oh, this is going to be hard. Your brain is going to trigger you. Uh-oh, this is hard. I don't know if you can do this to make you so that you don't do it. So you don't put yourself out there physically to put yourself through that pain because your body doesn't like going through that. Uh, your, your, if you desire to write a book, your brain might say, oh, who's going to read your book? Who's going to listen to your podcast? Why, why are you going to do it? Your brain's always telling you, it doesn't want you to deal with the disappointment or the embarrassment. So it's trying to keep you comfortable. Don't do it. You don't need to deal with all of that. And so our wires naturally, our brains are naturally wired for this negativity bias, seeing the bad in, in a lot of things. And so I think, I think a, a, a simple correlation or connection is we want those, we want the juicy gossip. We want, we want to see these fights. We want to see these debates because they trigger that emotion in us. It's like, wow, it's kind of this, this adrenaline, exciting, um, the emotional, the just, just kind of a roller coaster of a ride. But at the end, it leaves you dirty and muddy and drained. And I think it's very easy. Uh, emotions are contagious. Just like COVID-19 sickness is contagious, emotions are contagious. And one thing I do always talk about is, this difference between a fountain and a drain. Now, a fountain is someone who is a fountain of positivity, a fountain of energy, a fountain of calm, a fountain of perspective. And those feelings are contagious as well. Now, the opposite is, are the drains. They, are, uh, they, they suck the life out of the room. They have a problem for every solution. They're pessimistic and uh, they're, they're down on everything. They poke holes in everything. And sometimes they might say it's coming from a good place, but for the most part, uh, regardless if it's coming from a good place or not, it's, it's pulling the creativity out of a conversation or out of a room, even the fun, sucking the fun out of it. And so both types of energy are contagious and you got to ask yourself, okay, is my energy or is my attitude worth catching? Am I a fountain or am I a drain? Am I surrounding myself with fountains or am I surrounding myself with drains? Be very, be very mindful of that. That, I mean, that part right there is the last part about surrounding yourself with a fountain and a drain, like explaining it that way makes total sense. But are you born, like, are you born, I, do you think you're, you're born two different ways, like the pessimistic, the optimistic, or do you think it's more of like an upbringing and the people that you surround yourself with as you're going through it? I think it's both. So the analogy that I give is, is speed. Let's use speed. 
some kids or some people are just fast. They are fast. They've never had a speed coach. They've never had sprint training. They just fly. And there are some people who aren't fast. <laughs> They're just not. But they get a speed coach. They get training. They get coached on, on, on foot strike and where to, foot, uh, where to strike their foot on the ground. And all of a sudden, they start getting a little bit faster through coaching. The other people who are just naturally born fast, they're just fast. And then you give those people coaching and they're even faster. And that's where you get these Olympic sprinters who are born fast and they're elite and coached to be even faster. I think the same thing is with our, our personality traits. I think some people naturally uh, wake up, uh, not wake up, but they're born just in their DNA. They just tend to be a little bit more open, a little bit more agreeable than others. Some are a little bit more nervous or stressed out than others. You can look at the big five personality traits that some people think are a little bit more wired and static. However, regardless of what level of positivity or optimism or nervousness you have, there are certain tools or certain things or practices or even an environment you can put yourself in to help you improve, even if it's just a little bit, to take you from below average to average, from average to good, from good to great. And so whatever however you're wired DNA wise, you can get better wherever you are. I think that's like one of the most inspirational things about um, learning different things is like people will say that you can't, like you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but I, I've strongly disagreed with that just because maybe it's mentally, I want to get better at things. And so I have a problem saying can't, but um, that gives me information, uh, inspiration to like, okay, I can, I can do something a little bit now. And if I just keep my head down, like it may not come like right in this moment, like right this second. But if I just keep my head down and just keep creating a different habit over time, it becomes easy. And I didn't even realize that it happened. I love that you said that. It reminds me of Michael Phelps's coach. So Michael Phelps, obviously we know one of the greatest athletes in the history of the universe, uh, swimmer, Olympic swimmer. If you don't know who he is, Google Michael Phelps. Um, I'm sure everybody knows who Michael Phelps is, but in his book, he tells of a story on a training, during a training session where he didn't want to continue. He didn't want to do it. And he was exhausted. His lungs were on fire. His body was exhausted. His mentally, he was drained. And his coach told him to keep going. All right, now you got this drill. And he looks at his coach standing outside of the pool. He's like, I can't do that. I can't. And his coach says, you can't or you won't. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, you can do it. You don't, don't say you can't do it. Say you won't do it. And the guy's like, no, I, I can do it. Michael, the guy, Michael Phelps goes, I can do it. And so he goes and he does that. And so when, when we say, oh, I can't learn this new thing. I can't do that muscle up. I can't start this business. Ask yourself, you can't or you won't do it. And as you frame it that way, as you frame it that way, oh, I won't know. I'm going I'm to at least try it. I, I can do this. When, yeah, don't, don't mistake you can't do it for you won't do it. Because you can. You got to keep trying. But if you give up, it's because you're choosing to say, no, I, I won't do that. Like positive accountability. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's like – and. I mean, I guess I like I'll have negative thoughts too a lot of times about what I'm doing. I used to be a, like really, really shy and think I could never talk in front of people. I mean, I grew up and you, people thought I was a jerk because I never said anything, right? As I had to get to know you before I started talking. And usually that meant like an activity playing baseball or whatever. But um, necessity of making a living from, you know, becoming a sale commission only salesman at one point, you know, and that sort of thing, like being thrown into that. Um, I was nervous, but then I discovered that this is my most favorite thing to do is to talk to people and get to know them. And I'm like, Oh, it was hidden underneath there. And I didn't even realize it. I love that. You said that you are, you are a testament to the growth mindset. <laughs> I mean, now look, you have, pod, you have a podcast. <laughs> Here you are interviewing people and putting your voice and your, and your opinion and your face and your product out there in the world. And there may be someone out there who was just like you, who was shy, didn't want to talk to people, more recluse. More, and now you are showing them through their example that you can change, you can evolve. And I think in addition to that, 
as coaches, as parents, as leaders, as friends, let other let people change. Who they are today might not be the person who they are in a week, in two weeks, in 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 a, in a year. Instead of putting this label on them and saying, "Oh, you're shy. You're always going to be shy." Uh, to realize that, hey, they can change, they can evolve. And a lot of times people try to change and they try to evolve, but because the label is so strong on them that other people gave them, they can't ever shake those labels from other people. They're always gonna be looked as the shy person. They're always gonna be looked at as the, as the mess around kid or, or person who, who can't do anything for their lives. But deep down, they're trying, they're trying. That's where we're like, hey, don't worry about what other people think on you, about you and the labels they put on you. Just put your head down and know that you're always under construction and that you're still a work in progress. And that part's tough though, because it like the, the label, when you say the labels are strong, it is, but it's tough to push past that. Like mentally, it can be tough to get past that idea of what you are. I am glad. Yes. hundred percent. Yes, it is tough. Um, being positive is tough. Doing a podcast is tough. I always get this on, on Instagram. Always get this whenever I post stuff. Easier said than done. Easier said than done. Of course, it's everything I post is easier said than done. Are you kidding me? It's like, absolutely. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Absolutely. It's, it's oh, it's easier said than done to bounce back from failure. Exactly. It, it is easier said than done. But it's possible to do it. If you want to be the best version of yourself, you do it. It's hard to evolve. Yes. It's hard to work hard when people have bad labels on you. Yes. It's hard to thrive in this scenario where we're out, we are in the world. Yes. It's hard to be an elite athlete. Yes. It's hard. So what are you going to do about it? Yes. It is 100% hard. Uh, but that difficult is not bad. Uh, difficult is not impossible. Difficult is just difficult. And you can do difficult things. And I think it's more, like that's what that's where the reward is so big. It's like anything you do in life, the investment that you make. If it's a bigger investment, there's a bigger reward. Exactly. Exactly. It's supposed to be hard. Yes. And it's not what you get necessarily you get the end, but it's who you become in the process. Yeah. And so this brings up this is like, I look at elite athletes, high like CEOs, you name it, like successful people that have, that have like made something pursued a passion and gone through all this struggle and they're successful in what they do. And I look at, try to look at the difference between the people who don't get there and the people who do get there. And you were talking about like labels and that and pushing through the difficult part from your perspective, you know, dealing with high level athletes, all eyes are on them and the labels, if they mess up, once, twice in a row, three times in a row, their labels are so much bigger and magnified on them. So mentally, I would assume that they have to be that much better on that side of the game than just anybody else starting out. You're right. The, the room for making mistakes and making errors and being inconsistent is you're, they're walking on a tightrope because they have millions of eyes on them million dollar contracts, the stakes are the highest, extremely high, one misstep and everything's gone. Um, even, even, and you're competing, you're competing against the best in the world at the same time. And so a little, I remember talking once with an offensive lineman uh, in the NFL and he said, Justin, if I put my hand on his, if I, on his shoulder instead of his chest, I can literally disrupt the entire, I can ruin it for the receivers. I can ruin it for the quarterback. I can ruin it for everybody. If I just misplace my hand four inches, I can mess everything up uh, for the entire team. Guy gets around me, sacks a quarterback. We're now we're back at seven, eight yards or whatever. Uh, guy gets a sack. And so you're, you're right at the highest level. Uh, the, the, the margin for error is very small. And so, yes, they have to be, extremely talented at what they do. That's why preparation is extremely high for them. That's why attention to detail, that's why they embrace the boredom of consistency day in and day out to be elite. Uh, that's why it's, it's, they, they, they put so, they master their craft so much to that. Not only that they, they the phrase in the military phrase, Navy SEAL phrase is you don't rise to the occasion. You fall back to the level of your training. And they train so hard so that when the pressure's on, 
they fall back into their high level training. And so, yeah, it, it comes with a cost. Yeah. They have the, the money and the fame and the fortune, but if behind the scenes, if you see how hard these guys work on their craft, these monotonous, tedious, boring things, um, again, to reiterate the phrase I just said, they embrace the boredom of consistency, the way they eat, the way they sleep. It is not for the faint of heart. So what advice would you have for just somebody even just trying to start a business that they have these labels like you can't, they've never had the like, let's say they weren't born for it or their family wasn't in it or anything, even from like they're, they're overweight and they want to get in shape. And this is a tough thing for them to mentally overcome because they've always been this large person or whatever it is. Um, how do you break that label? Like what kind of habits do you suggest for breaking that label and to keep their mind going back to the positive? Yeah. So number one is that's normal. Number one, it's normal. Going back to what we just said is your mind, your body is going to try to keep you in this homeostasis state, keep you comfortable. It does not want you to get out of your comfort zone. It's scary. The unknown uh, breeds stress and anxiety, all part of it, all part of it. So number one is normalizing it. You are not unique in that sense. If you're feeling these feelings of negativity and doubt and insecurities, we all feel that. Even the best in the world feel that every single day. So uh, I don't want to say, make, sound mean necessarily, but you're not special in that way. Everyone feels that. So normalizing that, number one. Number two is you need a why. What's your, what's your why? Why are you going to take this journey? What's the purpose of going after this? Actually, you know what? Let me put it in a different acronym, GWOP. The letter G, the letter O, uh, G, W, O, P. G stands for your goal. Okay, so what, your mind is more likely to hit a target to the degree that your target is crystallized, crystallized in your mind, that you can envision, you know exactly where you want to go and what you want to do. Pick a target uh, and start by brainstorming. Grab a blank sheet of paper and write down things you want to accomplish. I don't care in what domain of your life, just brain dump it, put it all on paper. And then when you're done, it might take a couple days, literally. You might have just have this sheet open and just write from time to time. And then you look at it and you're like, pick one, pick one. It might be five years down the road. There might be one that you want to accomplish by this month. There might be one you want to accomplish in the next six months. Whatever you want, you decide. So you pick one. Now you have your goal. There's the G. Now you want to identify the W, the Y. Why do you want to do that thing? Why do you want to lose 10 pounds? Why do you want to uh, uh, try to make the CrossFit Games? Why do you want to start that business? Whatever it is, why? Your why is your fuel. It's going to be the thing that will light you on fire, that will that'll push you during those times that you don't want to go. You don't feel like going. The O stands for obstacles. Then you got to write down all of the obstacles that you're going to face in pursuit of this goal, all of them, external obstacles and internal obstacles. So for example, an, let's say, let's use getting in shape. Let's say use losing 10 pounds. Uh, an obstacle could be uh, celebrating. Uh, we have a lot of birthdays coming up in the next two months and a lot of birthday parties, a lot of good food there. An obstacle might be, oh, you, you might drive by and every time you drive by that restaurant or that Chick-fil-A, like, oh, I want to go there. Okay, maybe find a new route or whatever. So all the, and also the internal obstacles, write down all the things you say to yourself. You're not good enough. You don't have the support from your spouse. Uh, everyone buys junk, junk foods in a pantry. All of these potential obstacles. That's the O. The P stands for a plan. What is your plan to overcome those obstacles? Maybe it's not buying junk food anymore. Maybe it's having a conversation with somebody. Maybe it's forgiving yourself when you do fall back immediately and then, and then making the next best, best decision. And so research shows that you are a lot more likely to respond effectively to adversity if you plan to respond effectively to adversity. And so that's a simple little scaffold for people who are just getting started. Uh, the GWOP, identify a goal, what's your why, what are the obstacles, and what's your plan to overcome the obstacles? I think that's a simple um, uh, model for people to follow. I really like the way you just explained that because one of the most difficult things for me to figure out is my why. Like if I go through it, like I really want to do this. Like I really enjoy it. Well, why do I enjoy it? 
I don't know why I just enjoy it. Right. Like I, trying to go through and figure out why I enjoy the things I do or why I want to pursue this. And is it worth it? That's a really hard thing for people to figure out. Like it really I, is. Yep. I love that you said that. So the, the, the motivation purists or the purpose purists, and I don't even want to, I don't, you know, I don't want to say that. I, I don't want to say that. There are some people, I don't want to, I don't want to label an entire demographic, but there are some people who say you need to discover, you need to go down into the weeds with that. Why do I like it? Oh, because it's fun. Why is it fun? Uh, because it makes me happy. Why does it make you happy? And it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and then you just keep going deeper and deeper. And now you don't even know why. Like you really don't know why. It's like, what are we doing here? If it's fun, it's fun. Maybe that's your why. Okay, great. I do it because I love it. And, and there's a researcher named me, Hai Chi sent me Hai. It's called the autotelic experience, meaning the, the thing itself is why you do it. Some people go to the gym because they love going to the gym. That's it. That's it. But why do you love going to the gym? I don't, I don't know. I just love it. I love it. Uh, I, I love pizza. Why do you love pizza? It tastes good. But why does it taste good? Are you serious? It's just like, I don't need to go down. So that's one of the things I don't want anyone to get tripped up. If your why doesn't have to be something that is, oh my gosh, that's your big why changes your life. Universal why this is my purpose for living. Because the reality is that's a lifelong pursuit. Like you might not know that in, ever in your life. You might not know it until you look back. But here's another thing about your why. Your why want, you should trigger emotions. Some people, their why is, the reason I want to lose 10 pounds is because my brother said I looked overweight and I want to rub it in his face. Oh, like that's his why or that's her why. You know what? The reason I want to lose 10 pounds is because for my health. Because I, I want it, it, it's for my health, my liver is not good. And hey, you know what? I just want to, I want to feel good about myself. Great. That's great. Whatever kind of, some people I know, their why makes them mad. Their why makes them happy. Their why makes them sad. They're, I'm doing it for my mom. My mom said, uh, my mom passed away and, um, and she told me that I should lose some weight. And you know what? I'm doing this for mom. Well, shoot. I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to fight and debate that. Now, here's another thing. Your why is your why. You don't have to worry about making it noble. You don't have to put it out. Oh, my why is, is to make the world a better place. If that's not your why, you don't, make your, don't try to uh, appease people with your own why. If your why is to, I want to get rich and have a huge house. That's your why. Okay, what does it do to you? Oh, man, it makes me really want to work hard. Okay, great. Then go do it. You don't have to worry. Oh man, but that's not noble enough. And no, that's not, it, it seems so selfish. It's what does your why do to you that you, and you don't have to share it with anybody. It's personal. And one more thing about this, your why can change from time to time. Be aware when your why gets stale, because I've seen many times where people's whys get stale. I was working with a professional athlete and he made it to the NFL and he just didn't have that fire anymore. It was second year into the NFL and we were talking and I said, well, what's your why? Are you willing to share that with me? Because it's personal. Some don't. And I understand that. And they're like, yeah, my why is to make it to the NFL. And he stopped mid sentence. His why was to make it to the NFL. Well, he's been in the NFL for the past two years. And that was the moment he realized that he needed a new why. He already accomplished it and he didn't even realize it. And all throughout college, his why it pushed him to get to the NFL, get to the NFL. It got him to work really hard. He got to the NFL, and now he's coasting, just coasting. He realized that his why was already accomplished. Now his why is be a starter, or his why is make the Pro Bowl. Now he set the bar even higher, and then he got right back on track. And wouldn't you know, he ended up making the Pro Bowl. Um, but he just shifted his why. And not to say that's going to work for everybody, but take a look at your why. It might, it might be stale. That's really, really awesome in the fact that your why doesn't have to change outside of, because in my mind, if, like, if I was going to change my why, it would have to be a totally different subject, if you want to say. Like, he stayed inside the same subject. He just raised his level for his why. Like, your why can yeah, change yeah. anyway. That's, that's an interesting way of thinking about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you might, be, yeah, again, I don't get too wrapped up into, is that a why or is that a goal? Boy, I kind of don't get, don't, that, those are procrastination techniques, to be quite honest. If you, if you are debating, oh, is like you're, 
it's kind of it's kind of like people will search up workout routines or workout clothes to get to avoid doing the thing that they should be doing which is working out <laughs> go work out and uh, <laughs> these are called like procrastination techniques that people think it feels good oh i'm looking up i'm reading workout articles oh this is really good it's like no you're you're literally avoiding doing the thing you should be doing which is working out and so yeah don't get too tripped up in these things make it quick put it down go take action and that kind of leads into like a whole other thought that i have all the time which i like to test myself with anytime i feel that um that sort of you know and just action sports in general i think bred this into me the love of doing that is when it gets a little scary like i feel that little like Mm, I don't know if I, this might be embarrassing if I miss this, right? Or if, if I take this chance and go in front of people, am I fully prepared? Um, am I going to embarrass myself? I like to take that step and my face may be blushed and I may be red and I may embarrass myself. But once that first embarrassment's over and it's, it's like, Oh man, that was not good. It gets like, I get more confidence. I figured out that I build more confidence whenever I push myself in that sort of area to do something. I love that you said that. The confidence that you reminded me of one of my favorite proverbs. I believe it's a Russian proverb. Uh, a bird can rest peacefully on a branch, not because of its trust in the branch, but because of its trust in its ability to fly. And I love that. And, I, and what you just described is just that. Your confidence and your ability to get up. That is everything. That's everything. Like you, 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 the podcast might fail. You might fall doing this, this roller blade, blade trick. You might not be able to lift this snatch or this PR. But you know what? Even if it doesn't work out, I know I'm going to get back under the bar. I know I'm going to get back up and try it again. My confidence in my ability to bounce back from failure, your confidence ability in your ability to bounce back from failure with blood on your face and blush, uh, blush cheeks because you're kind of embarrassed and to do it again, that is, the, that is it. Like that is the key. Because a lot of times confidence is misplaced. Oh, my confidence in my strength, my confidence in, in my training, which is true. But if you can have confidence in your ability to get up after failure and do it again, oh, that is, a, that is a competitive advantage. And I think it's so true. If you want to learn, fail privately. But if you want your learning to be accelerated, fail publicly. Put it out there. Like you fail in front of everybody. That is where the real learning is, is accelerated and you just skyrocket my heart's like beating fast already. Like when you're saying that I'm picturing like a pitcher walking out to the mound in a playoff game, you know, and they've got a bad record in playoff games. Like, you know what I mean? There's this thing where you're, you're walking out in front of millions and I put myself in this position, even though it's like tiny, but I picture like, would I be brave enough to walk out there and would I be mentally strong enough to go out there and throw those pitches at my best? Or would I let that bother me? Uh, yeah, you bring, up, you bring up a good point in that it's, it's interesting. So I don't know if anyone has ever heard a, an athlete. We'll just use an athlete in particular because it's, it's an easy conversation. It find, easy to find an example. After a big game, Tom Brady, uh, Mike Trout, anybody, any, anyone, after a big game, the interview asked them, so what were you thinking during that moment? Oh, were you nervous during that moment? Generally speaking, the athletes would be like, no, I was just focused on one pitch at a time or, or hey, I was just, I was just took a deep breath and I just, and some say, I wasn't even thinking. No, I wasn't thinking. I was just kind of doing my own thing. The people who were most nervous were all of us watching. Like <laughs> we were nervous watching. The athlete them, himself or herself, they're just, once they're nervous leading up to it. Leading up to it, yeah, their hearts are pounding, they're nervous, the thoughts are going. Once they step on the mound, once the hitter steps in the box, once the CrossFit, uh, the elite CrossFitter, once it goes three, two, one, go, all those nerves, boom, are gone. And the spectators, all of us are nervous for them, but the athlete's not nervous because they're so lost in the moment. They're doing what they love and we're just watching. We're just watching them do it. And so a lot of times these elite athletes, once they have that, once they go, it's, they, just, they just fall back under their training. Their go is kind of like this podcast. You might be nervous to start the podcast now we're in it we're good 
I was nervous before I came on talking to you. I was like, okay, heart's beating. How are we going to do? We're not, we're, neither one of us are nervous. We're just having a conversation. And so that's how a lot, a lot of athletes experience as well. That makes a lot of sense why the intros and starting off the podcast is so difficult. It's like the most difficult part of the podcast. Like once you get rolling, it's fine. Like exactly. it, it flows. Exactly. It's that way with starting a conversation with somebody new. Like you don't know them. You're going to walk up and say hi to them. How do you do that? I don't know. What do I say? What do I do? Am I going to look stupid? Exactly. Once you're in it, boom, you go. That's exactly what athletes go through as well. Leading up to it, the nerves, the, the stomach, got to go to the bathroom, the nods, the heart rate, the breathing rate, the, the random thoughts. And then once it's go time, okay, oof, let's go. Let's do this. That's, and I mean, so when I was doing stuff, that brings up another thing with me. This, uh, this is just going to, this could go down all sorts of rabbit holes, but I notice, you know, whenever I do competitions, if I'm, and I just self-realization, like I get tight, you know, like uh, if I get tight and I go in thinking and all that, I didn't have my best performance. And I watched, you know, the people who are so much better than me and how they conducted themselves. And it was like a, it was a deep breath this calmness that they laid over themselves so like, okay, just be in control, be calm and forget about everything else. Like once it's there and the way I look at it, like if I'm doing even the open, even if it's the CrossFit open, like I pay 20 bucks, I'm in my local gym, I'm not going anywhere, right? I'm having fun with my friends, but I'm still super competitive. Like that's me. Like I, I'm, I'm going to compete with myself all the time and with the people in the gym. But I, I find myself like I take a deep breath and I let it out and I go to a place of total relaxation or try to because I want my heart rate as low as possible because I know I perform for me the best when I'm in that mode. On a scale of one to 10, let's say one is really, really relaxed, getting ready to go to bed. That's how low one is. Uh, number two, number 10 is incredibly energetic, like the max, max energy, max high mics, max going. What number or what number range for you to perform at your best in the CrossFit competition, what number range do you, do you try to be at on a scale of one to 10 of intensity? I would say, well, it's going to change during yes. the middle of it in my yes. mind. So the start, I try to be in the beginning, the start. Yeah. The start in the beginning. I try to be like between a three and a five. Perfect. So what we call that is your hype number. We want to get you, you want to get you between a three and a five. And so if you were my athlete and we we're working together, we would have a conversation about what does three to five feel like? What does your body feel like? What is your mind feeling? What would just this, this physiological awareness that tell me about the tightness level and we'll have a conversation on what three to five feels like. And then we'd have a conversation on what six to 10 feels like and what it looks like. And, and then we would identify, okay, great. What are some tools that you can do if you're feeling a six, seven, eight, nine, ten, to bring you back down to your height number, your three to five number? And you already have one, your deep breath. Some people it's music, some people it's visualization, some people it's keywords, some people it's journal writing, some people it's meditation. Like there's a lot of different things you can use. But identify, like whoever's listening to this, what is your hype number range, three to five, someone else, it might be six to seven, it might be five to six. Identify, understand what it looks like when it's above it. What are some tools that you need to bring you back to your number? And then if you're not, sometimes you go into the gym and you're dragging. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm at a one or a two. I want to go back to bed for those early classes. If you go to those ones, or maybe you had a long day at work, what do you do to get yourself up from a two to three to a five to six. And so you need some tools to get you up as well. And so those are some, uh, some simple strategies that people can take away. I, I, I dig that. And I like figuring out like self-realization on certain things and like focusing on it is something that's really important to me that I've gained over time. I didn't know, like, I didn't always have it, but once I started doing, it, I was like, Oh, I need to do this a lot more often. Like be more aware. And what you said made me like, you're telling me that I feel like you're coaching me. Like I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going through the process. Like, all right, now I'm going to be more aware of that number as I get to start. Like, okay, now I know where I'm at. Now I know where I'm focused on. Is there any tips to help people like self-realize things like that? Like what you just told me? I, 
think that is a very important point that you just brought up. I'm going to answer that question, but um, in, a, in addition, I'll have a thought about that. I always get asked, what do you tell athletes? What do you tell them? How do you coach them? What do you say to them? What do you tell them to do? And I respectfully say, I don't tell you know, an elite athlete to do anything. Like, I am not going to tell them what to do. They are great um, at what they do. They're not, I don't work with broken athletes. I don't work with, I don't need to fix anybody. I am a performance optimization specialist. How do we take you from good to great? How do we take you from great to better? How do we take you from average to good? I'm not a, oh, come talk to Justin if you lack focus. Go talk to Justin if you lack motivation. Go talk to Justin if you lack confidence. No. The people I work with are uber confident. They are uber focused. They want to literally take where they are to the next level. And so I, I, what I do is the first thing I do is try to help them realize that all of the answers they're looking for are within their own power. They have all the answers. And so all I do is supply them with questions. And I think you just, we just modeled it together. Hey, what number do you need to be in between one and 10? Oh, what do you do to bring it down? Cool. See ya. Now you were already doing it. I didn't tell, I didn't give you something you're not already doing. I didn't tell you something you're not, you don't already know. I literally just gave you a handle on, uh, kind of labeled it for you. Oh, that's called uh, your hype number, scale of one to 10. Uh, what number are you? Bring it down with the, bring it down with the deep breath and I leave. And you're like, Oh, I already do that. Now you're just a little bit more aware of it. Um, so that's what I do for a living. I'm not introducing these new concepts or anything. I'm trying to highlight what these people are already doing and inviting them or encouraging them to continue to do what they're already doing, but just more on purpose with purpose. Um, but to answer your question, self-awareness, self-awareness starts with questions, self good self questions. If you want better answers, start asking yourself better questions. What, a lot of people ask themselves, they just ask themselves the wrong questions. Why am I so bad? Why do I always do that? Why is he better than me? Why is she better than me? Why, why are they so lucky? Why is in the economy like this? Why are they not wearing a mask? Why do we have to be quarantined? All of these questions, like the, we have no control over these questions. And just look at what these questions do for you. When you ask those questions, do the answers help you? Or do they hurt you? Do they make you more positive and effective? Or do they make you more negative and reactive and mad and at, at people? So start with the questions. Question, ask yourself questions like, what is my why? What's the source of my confidence? How do I, despite this difficulty, what, what do I need to focus on? How can I get 1% better every single day? What new small habits can I start to adopt? What do I need to start doing? What do I need to stop doing? What do I need to keep doing? Just start asking yourself that question. Number one, those self questions, just ask better questions and answer them, write them down. Number two, I'm only gonna offer two, um, cause that's all I know. Uh, so <laughs> then you're gonna go to, so what I would do is then go to someone who you trust and whose opinion you really value and you sit down in front of them or on a Zoom or Skype call, FaceTime, or over the phone, and you say, you tell them, I really value you. I value your opinion, and maybe you wanna tell them why. And then you say, I'm sitting here with a blank sheet of paper and a pen, and I wanna get better. I wanna be a better version of myself. Can you please share with me critical feedback about me? Tell me about my blind spots. I'm giving you permission to be absolutely truthful and honest with me. The things that I fall short on, your opinion on how I can get better. And I promise you, I'm not going to rebuttal it. I'm not going to defend myself. I'm not going to get mad at you because I'm coming to you. And then you put your proverbial seatbelt on and you get ready because they are going to rock your socks uh, with some, some feedback that might be very difficult to swallow. And in my experience, that has been some of the most eye-opening experiences I've ever had. Now, you've got to be very careful on who you go to. Uh, it might not be helpful to go to mom because mom loves you. 
oh no, you're great, Aaron. No, you're so good. You're and no offense. I love moms. Love moms are great. Love my mom. Lo love her so much. You want to go to someone who who is going to give you that tough feedback, um, but that you do value. You don't want to. Don't go to someone who's going to crush you. And they're like, oh good, I've been waiting for this. And they just they, they just they don't care about your feelings or don't care like. You got to be very careful who you go to. You know, someone who really, really knows you. You don't want someone to help you feel better. You want someone to help you get better. I like the way you worded that. That was pretty good because any, I don't know what's ego. I don't know what it is that tells you like you have these blind spots of things you think you're good at and you're not good at. But yes. being able to accept that honest feedback without the excuse coming back is a hard thing for even the most positive best in the world if you tell somebody they're bad at something they're going to want to rebuttal that with their own set of like but 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 exactly exactly and so that's where it needs to be planned it's an actual exercise you got to choose that person carefully and uh and yeah it's it's a it's a very it's eye-opening and i've done it a few times and um uh, and i've been the person to give the feedback a few times and that's hard too it, we always talk about it's hard to receive feedback it's hard to give critical feedback because you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but, uh, but you want to do so tactfully. It's, it's not, it's not an easy exercise. It's not as easy as some people make it, uh, make it out to be. And in your position, it, I imagine it's even a little bit more difficult because you're always on the positive side of like you're positive, positive, positive. And then for you, like being this guy, who's this mental coach, like stay positive. This is what you have to do. Do you ever need coaching in your area? Yeah. So one thing about that, um, how do I word this? Uh, I am not actually always positive, positive, positive. Uh, I, I, I know how my personality comes off. Uh, very excitable. I am smiley. Uh, some might say I'm bubbly. I am positive. I like to, like to look at the bright side. Uh, it reminds me of the story. I was... Um, I was coaching a group of military uh, platoon sergeants. For those who have been in the military and you think platoon sergeants, these NCOs, non-commissioned officers are very straight, like no nonsense. And I'm coaching a group of them, a lot of them, and with my personality. And I'm smiling and I'm energetic and I have passion behind it. I'm, I'm pretty... Like I, I'm in your face a little bit. And, um, and I was talking about being optimistic and the science of optimism. And a guy raises his hand. He goes, I completely disagree with you. He goes, I'm, I'm sick of hearing all this positivity stop, talk and sunshine and rainbows. He goes, this is a military. We don't need positivity. We, we need more pessimism. That's what we need because we have lives at stake. And, and you see all like the other platoon sergeants like, yeah, yeah, that's right. You tell him, you tell Justin. And I looked at him and I said, I absolutely disagree with you. And you just felt the room like, what? Like you're disagreeing with this guy? Because he was the most vocal of them all. And I said, I said, well, then let me tell you why. What's your understanding of pessimism? He goes, glass is half empty. And I said, okay, even your definition is wrong. A true pessimist, a pure pessimist is not only is the glass half empty, it's always going to be empty and there's nothing I can do about it. Is that what you're saying we need? And he's like, no, no, we don't need that. I said, yeah, so we don't need pessimistic leaders. And what I can see where optimism and positivity can rub people the wrong way. What positivity is not, positivity is not sunshine and rainbows. Positivity is not even smiling. Some of the most positivity, positive people I know aren't smiley they don't smile you can be positive and you don't have to have be full of energy you can be positive and you don't have to be an extrovert you could be a introverted uh stone face person who's very very positive what positivity is it's being able to look at the brutal facts of a situation and saying yeah this is hard yeah this sucks yeah this is difficult yeah, I don't like this. Seeing that and then saying, okay, what are we going to do about it? That is the essence of positivity. So when players come up to me, going back to your question, when players come up to me and they give me very difficult thing, uh, situations, I say, yeah, that does suck. That's hard. That is extremely hard. 
So what are you going to do about it? And my job isn't to give them advice. My job is to just help them reframe it. They have the, I'm not going to tell these guys what to do. I'm not going to be, oh, you should keep things in perspective. Hey, buddy, you should just be positive, man. Just be positive. There's never have I ever said that to anybody because no one wants to be told to be positive, especially when they're angry or they're mad or they're sad. It's like telling someone who's mad, relax. Hey, come on, relax. <laughs> that is the worst thing you could tell somebody. And so exactly, that's, that's going to get them to do the opposite of what, what of, uh, that's, that's going to ratchet their intensity even higher. So I don't tell people to relax. I don't tell people to be positive. I just give them more questions. Hey, so what are you going to do about it? Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's tough. That's difficult. Yeah, you, you've been scuffling. It's been hard. Why do you think that is? Oh, I think it's because of this, huh? So, so what do you think you need to do about that? Oh, probably this, huh? That's a good idea. Have you thought about this? Oh, no, I never thought about that. I don't know. Maybe or maybe not, that might not be a case. Maybe, but maybe something to think about. All right, cool. See you, man. That's it. We're done. Yeah, so that's, that's what I do. Just help them see things differently. They have their own answers. And I'm not a, I'm not a going out, throwing out positivity uh, uh, mantras or statements or even, I don't even think I say the word positivity ever with people. But it can come off as being positive. Yeah, well, that's what, not wrong. Your comment earlier about like the Instagram, you know, comments and stuff about easier said than done. You know, they're looking at you as this guy like, oh, he's just this Mr. Positivity all the time. That sparked that question in my head where I'm going, I, I'm more than certain he's not like just Mr. Positivity all the time. He's a obstacle overcome all the time. Like, yeah. how, are we, how are we gonna get over this challenge? Yeah, I think it's true. And, and I think a lot of people mistake, or just all of us, uh, a person's personality for the way they view the world. Um, uh, yeah, I, I th and I think, again, on Instagram, you only see one side of me. But, uh, but yeah, I get frustrated. I get sad. I get, I get angry. I yell. I, I, we have disagreements. And, and yeah, it's, it's true. But the way I'm wired, I am wired a little bit more excitable. I am, I am encouraging. I am, I do, I am positive. I do encourage people. I do all that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in the in the elite professional military world, um, that that's annoying. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's, it's like you don't want to like. Oh my gosh, it's eye, well, eye rolling. But uh, but to know that yeah, my job isn't uh, the, the cheerleader necessarily. It's okay. Let's. But let's give you some strategies backed by research um, in this is my personality. Uh, and then people do the exact same job that I do with a much different personality, but they're conveying the exact same messages. We just have different styles. And my personality is just a little bit different. Um, that resonates with some. And to be quite honest, that does not resonate with others. Yeah, like the proper fit, like you said earlier, be selective in who you go to to ask this question to give yeah. you feedback about yourself. You need somebody that not only is going to give you honest feedback and be that mirror that you need on yourself, but also somebody who's going to deliver it in a way that you respect and understand. You bring up a really good point too. And I did not answer your question. Who do I go to? Okay, so <laughs> if, if I want to, if I want to know how I'm doing with players, I go to players. Hey, give me feedback. Tell me what can I do to get better? And the players will let you know, uh, do this more, do more of this, do less of this do this don't do this if i want feedback on critical feedback on how to be a better help to staff and coaches and leadership i go to a member of the staff coach or leadership hey what am i doing if i want advice on how to be a better husband or father i'm going to my wife and she has she's ready to give me feedback <laughs> and so uh so yeah if i want feedback on how to be a better dad i'll even go to my kids i'll go to them and say hey honestly daddy like i will tell you like you have the freedom, to tell me. And my kids will say, dad, you're on your phone too much. Dad, sometimes when I want to show you my stuff, like it seems like you're not even paying attention. Like you, dad, you don't even come out of your office until way late, can you come out earlier? They would never tell me this until I ask. And so I'm very, I, I'm even targeted to very specific um, people for very specific domains or aspects of my life. When you do that, when you do that sort of thing, like hearing the kid thing, having kids myself, you know, that would be something that would sting a little. It would oh, sting yeah. to hear like, you know, you're on your phone too much. Like that right there would sting me. We'd be like, dude, I need to change that up. How, does that help you be more like 
the way you ask questions and the way you deal with certain athletes or anybody that's asking your advice, does that help you come from a perspective of how to understand it better? Yeah. Uh, pain triggers change. Pain triggers change. And I think that is something that we all know. It does sting. And every time I ask my kids stuff too, is they have something for me. <laughs> Remember that time you said this, daddy? I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot it. Yeah, that really hurt my feelings. I cried that night when, when I was like, I am so sorry. I didn't even realize that. And so that, you're right, it does sting. But another thing that, that I'm just thinking about now, when you're the one who's asking for feedback, you're the one who's in the driver's seat. So yes, it stings, but I think it doesn't trigger as much negative emotion because you are the one who asked for it. I'm the one who's saying, all right, I am getting in the car, I'm buckling my seatbelt, I'm choosing this path, I'm gonna drive through this storm. I don't know how it's gonna be, but I'm driving. As opposed to someone coming up to you or on social media giving you unsolicited feedback. Like, they just throw it at you, like, I wasn't asking you, number one, who are you, number two, you know, and then it might be great feedback that they give you, and it might be true, but because you didn't ask for it, you don't know this person and, and yeah, you don't ask and you don't know this person. You might be so emotional and so angry that you don't even learn the lesson. You're like, you know what? Forget you. I'm not even accept that because you don't know me and I didn't ask for it. But if you put yourself in it because you weren't in the driver's seat, they were in the driver's seat and they put it on you. When you do it this way, you're in the driver's seat. Yes, it stings. Yes, it's painful, but your, your heart and your mind is prepared for it. And you're asking these things with the intent to change as opposed to opening up your DMs or going to your comments. You're like, who is this person? You go into there, okay, let me see who this person, who are you giving me feedback? And so, yeah, it's uh, just the psychology of it is, is, is beneficial. And that just like made me think of something right there is that the most frustrating thing sometimes to accept is unsolicited advice. Like you're in the gym, this guy may be a great athlete, whatever, but you didn't ask for any tips on, you know, how to lift that weight. You didn't ask for any tips over here, over there, but they gave it to you. Is there, a, and I don't even know if it's possible. Is there a way for you to give unsolicited advice in a way that will be accepted? It's got to be done. Number one, you've got to ask yourself, what's a couple things to consider? Here's some variables to consider. Number one, how strong is my relationship with this person? Now, that number one, how strong is my relationship with the person? You might not have to get to question number two if you're like, ah, it's not good. Like literally, like the question number one, okay, good. Uh, is this and, and the good indicator is, is my, strong, is my relationship strong enough that it can bear the weight of truth? That's where you know a relationship is strong. It, you want to build a relationship so strong it can bear the weight of truth. And so number one. Number two, is the timing right? Is the timing right? Um, how are my emotions? How are their emotions? How is the, the environment? Is this the time that I should go and give this unsolicited feedback? Is should I do it right now while they're in the middle of the workout? Should I do it afterwards? Should I do it next week? Uh, that number one, number two, number three is how should I give this feedback? Should it be verbal? Should it be a text? Should it be through somebody else? Maybe I should look at the coach and I notice it. I'm good friends with the coach. Hey, he needs to spread his feet a little bit more. Or and oh, it's come. It, so maybe I'm not the go-to person. Maybe it should come from some, they'll receive it from someone else. And the coach is like, oh, I didn't even notice that, Justin. Thank you. And the coach goes and gives it. Okay, good. I gave it, but I didn't give it, if, if that makes any sense. And then the last one is, what, how should I do it? More tactical. I, myself, if I'm going to be the one doing it, if let's say I'm going to give you feedback, Aaron, I'm going to do it with questions. As I've been saying throughout this entire podcast, the use of questions. Hey, tell me about, uh, tell, I'm curious. Tell me about your feet placement. You're going there as opposed to outside, as opposed to inside. Tell, to walk me through that. And then they, so you are not jumping. So I'm not jumping to conclusions. Maybe you're doing it on purpose. Maybe you know exactly why you're doing it. And here I am coming in thinking that you don't and you really do. So number one is, not, I'm giving you all these lists for no reason. So one thing I try to do is I try to assume positive intent. 
assume positive intent. I don't know why his feet were so close. I don't know why he posted that. I don't know why she did that. Um, and, and so just number, number one, and maybe ask, hey, tell me, walk me through that. Well, I'm just curious, that's, that's, that's interesting. And then if, it, if, if maybe you can offer suggestions, hey, what about, even suggestions like when you're giving feedback, you wanna use phrases like, what about, or I wonder if, or what do you think about, these are soft. These are a bit that primes them. You're not forcing them to do anything, but huh, hey, I, I wonder if spreading your legs, if it's gonna activate it, if it's more safe. I, I don't know. I, I wonder if, almost a curiosity to get them thinking, not that spread your legs and help this. Then all of a sudden they're gonna get up in arms and be ready to fight. More of a curiosity approach to help gently nudge them one way or the other. At the end of the day, they're gonna live their life. And then knowing, remembering the quote, Knowledge is knowing what to say. Wisdom is knowing whether or not to say it. And so that's where you gotta, you gotta filter it through that. I know what to say, should I say it or not? And most of the time for me, I don't say it. I'm like, okay, just, they're fine. They're fine, yeah. I think most of the time that's probably gonna be the answer. I just popped in my head as a question like, man, that is something that's real because you wanna say something to somebody to help them out, but then, you think, like I think about it, I'm like, oh, I don't know that I, that's going to be received too well because I don't like it when it's done to me just randomly. Exactly. And then on the opposite side, what do you do when you get unsolicited advice? I would met now myself, I get it all the time, by the way. I get it. People are in my DMs or in my emails. Well, you left this out. You left this out. You left this out. I'm like, okay, I have... 140 characters on Twitter. I don't have a journal. I'm not going to write a journal article. Of course, I'm going to leave things out. Um, I have one minute on Instagram, like, or I have a, it's, it's Instagram. I'm not writing a scientific journal. There's no way I can include everything. And so constantly getting that. And so I am now mentally prepared. Okay. I might get some unsolicited advice. Sometimes I'll write back. Okay. Thank you. Whatever. Or sometimes I will uh, crack my crack my knuckles and, and become a keyboard warrior um but yeah it, it just depends it depends but I'm, I'm prepared for it awesome man well thank you justin for being on the show let everybody know where they can find your content your stuff um learn more about you your books whatever you've got going on yeah justin sua at instagram i'm on instagram at j-u-s-t-i-n-s-u-a all my stuff's there yeah my from my podcast to my books to uh, you'll, I, you'll, you'll find it there. Right on, man. Thank you. So, oh yeah, everybody, I have to say this, your podcast, the five minute thing. I forgot to even talk to you about this because it was on my mind to say it, but I love that you started it and it's only five minutes and it's, every, it's like every day. It's a five minute thing every day. And you can start out with like a refreshing, like I'll listen to it while I'm doing the podcast in the morning. It's just like a Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I can do these things today. Like I, I like it just gets you started in like a positive mood. Like hearing you talk that. about it. It was genius. Like what what was your decision on making it go five minutes? Yeah. Um, it came down to the people I work with. So I was they don't have a lot of time. These athletes, they just don't have time. And I thought, I want to make something. So we do something in pro sports. We're called you teach them in the white space. So I'll do sessions in one minute or two minutes, as opposed to 45 minute PowerPoint with them. It's, they don't have that time. And so I thought, okay, since I'm doing it with these elite athletes, why not do it with everybody else? Just give them content three to five minutes long as they're driving to work, simple. So, and focus on one thing, one takeaway. All right, come back tomorrow, we'll have one more thing for you. And that's where it started five years ago. We're on episode 1,154. <laughs> That's so awesome. I, I just wanted to let everybody know that because it really is cool. It takes five minutes and it puts you in a good mood. So thanks, brother. Yeah, it was awesome. All right. Thanks again, Justin. Pre appreciate this. Thank you, Aaron.